stunning developments now in a scandal that Victorian Premier Daniel Andrews must have thought was now behind him. Ten years ago, Andrews and his wife, his wife was driving, turned into a street in the Mornington Peninsula and collided with a 15-year-old cyclist, Ryan Muleman. Now, Ryan was very badly hurt, but strange things then happened. Mrs Andrews wasn't breath tested. Ryan wasn't asked to give a statement to police. And Andrews told police a story that stuck two cents. Their car was travelling very slowly and the cyclist hit the side of that car, in fact, at a perfect right angle. I want to make it clear, Andrew said, the cyclist hit our vehicle. But then things got even stranger. Last year, pictures emerged of the damage to the Andrew's car. That smashed windscreen doesn't look like the cyclist hit it from the side, does it? Plus, there's the damage to the fender. And now the Herald Sun reports that paramedics who treated Ryan noted in their patient care report, 15-year-old on bike, struck on left side by car, travelling 40 to 60 kilometres an hour. In other words, the cyclist was hit by the car, not the other way around, and hit from the left by a car travelling 40 to 60 kilometres an hour. Joining me is Kel Glare, former Chief Commissioner of Victoria Police. Kel Glare, thank you very much for your time. Look, there's so much that's really weird about this, this case. Uh, for a start, the, the cyclist did not have a statement taken by police. But more particularly, there was no breath testing of the driver, Daniel Andrews' wife. We were told six years ago by the then Chief Commissioner, Graham Ashton, this was because the two police in the scene both thought the other did it. But now we find police notes saying it wasn't done because Mrs Andrews didn't seem affected by alcohol. What do you make of all this? Well, it was a, a, a horrendous collision. Uh, there was a young lad at the time seriously injured. There was a lot of damage to a vehicle. Uh, if police had followed standard procedure, we wouldn't be having this conversation. The fact of the matter is that there was no case for exercising judgment. Standard procedure would have required the driver to be breathalyzed. Uh, there should have been a proper forensic investigation. The car should never have been allowed to leave the scene. It was unroadworthy. And uh, the whole thing uh, really smacks of, uh, I suppose, uh, someone uh, being overawed by perhaps who was involved. Uh, it's hard to explain uh, why it uh, played out the way it did. It is quite strange. We've seen uh, since uh, police say uh, much later, well, you know, we, we stuffed this up a bit. Uh, sorry about that. Um, there's another aspect to this. Daniel Andrews has said that their car was travelling very slowly and was absolutely T-boned, those were his, his words, absolutely T-boned from the side by the cyclist. He ran into them. And yet now we find a patient care report from the ambulance paramedics at the time that's it's only just been discovered by the cyclist lawyers. It says, 15-year-old on bike struck on left side by car travelling 40 to 60 kilometres an hour. If that is true, should police at the time have taken this case much further? Well, certainly there should have been a, a better and proper investigation. Uh, I've attended hundreds of accidents. Uh, I've never seen a car so badly damaged by a cyclist riding into it. I've certainly seen that sort of damage when a car has uh, you know, mown down a cyclist. So if there'd been a proper investigation, uh, we wouldn't be having, a, as I said, this conversation. And it's not fair to the now young man involved or to the Andrews. Uh, it all could have been avoided simply by police doing their job properly. And that didn't happen. But what should police be doing now, do you think? I mean, we're seeing these documents uh, emerge uh, that challenge the case that was presented by the Premier and at times by the police. Uh, it is some time now, it's a decade later, but uh, what should police be doing? I think it needs a total review from start to finish. Uh, there needs to be a forensic analysis of the damage to the car and uh, to see whether you know, what's uh, said by both sides is consistent. Uh, it would be interesting if those involved all had a, um, a lie detector test just to see who is in fact uh, giving the, the most uh, truthful account. 
So only a proper investigation and a thorough investigation, and there's, there are grounds for it, as I understand, there have been three different explanations as to why there wasn't a breath test. There are those ambulance uh, uh, people's notes. Uh, there are things that can be followed up, and I think in fairness to everyone, that should now occur. And do you think the police owe that as a... You know, there would be people suspecting, whether true or not, whether fair or not, that uh, he is police and a politician, a Labor politician, now very senior politician, obviously, the Premier. Uh, you know, uh, it's all a bit too cosy. Is it something police should do, a review of this whole case, in order just to say, look, here it is, we're very transparent, it's all in the open, there's no need to suspect. Even if it comes out, you know, with an absolute clean sheet, I don't know, but should it be done to uh, bolster public confidence in the police? It certainly should. Look, all these things are important. They're all serious. They all warrant a proper approach. When there's someone of a uh, high public profile involved, I think it's even more incumbent upon police to take every routine standard step so that no questions can be raised as to the efficacy, efficacy of their approach. And, of course, uh, we, this is not going away. Uh, simply, as I say, police didn't follow routine procedure. It's really quite extraordinary to me. Uh, there you go. Kel Glare, thank you so much indeed for your time.